and welcome to City Chats with Joyce. I'm Joyce Dooley, Senior Research Analyst for Z Prime. I'm incredibly excited about our conversation today. We're going to be talking about mobility reimagined, how mobility can be often thought of in very physical terms, right? You need cars, buses, scooters, and more to move throughout a city. But what if we could add a digital layer to better manage mobility? So joining us today uh, is with the LA Department of Transportation, the one and only Jarvis Murray. And we're going to just dive on in. Jarvis, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Joyce. And it's really great seeing you again. Yeah, I'm really excited. I mean, we had such a great discussion a few weeks back, and I'm just really excited to get it recorded so that way that, you know, other people can learn just as much as I learned when we just spoke last. Um, before we get too far in, I really want to know what makes you so passionate about smart cities and mobility? You know, I think what makes me passionate about it is... I mean, I care about it because as a city, you want it to be wonderful for everyone who's there. And for a city to be really wonderful, I think people need to have access to numerous modes of transportation. And that includes having choice in that transportation. And so for me, you know, I work with a lot of private operators in my role, I'm, I'm a regulatory role. So I work with a lot of private companies. And so I have to ensure some level of profitability for them. Um, however, you know, I'm really trying to make sure that people in the city have easy availability, um, easy on demand, and something for those people in each part of the city. And on top of that, for that easy availability and easy on demand, I'm also concerned about those who work within those industries. So for me, it's the drivers, um, you know, the drivers of taxi cabs, drivers of ambulances, and even the employees of the various companies that, that operate on our landscape. So that's a a big portion of me of what makes a city fully inclusive. I'm caring about the customers, the workers, and everybody involved. So in order for that to really make, for it to really work, um, I really think a smart city is, a, is important. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much. I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. And it's such a critical part of being in a city, too, is your ability to move and have access to, you know, uh, transportation and mobility. So Diving right on in, uh, LA's Department of Transportation has some really cool projects going on. Would you be able to share more about what you're working on and how you know um, it's changing the shape of your city? Yeah, so you know, in my role again, I'm in a regulatory role, uh, and in our department, I basically regulate and manage taxi cabs, private ambulance, non-emergency medical transportation. Um, the dockless scooter program and sidewalk delivery robots. So basically private, private entities that are on our right of way. And the thing that we are working on for us is we're moving them all onto what we call the mobility data specification. And it's MDS for short in the city of LA. And what that means for us is that I want the ability to be able to adjust behavior uh, as we see it on the right of way. Mm. So right now we already do this with our scooters. And with our scooter program, for example, uh, one of our business, busiest areas is Venice. And in that area, what we do is we, we kind of cap the number of scooters that are in that area and we dictate where they kind of can and can't go. So for example, we don't want them riding along the boardwalk because they're a little bit fast, right? And, you know, versus someone who's just pedaling. And so we don't allow them on the boardwalk. We geofence that area out. We cap it at 150 scooters per company in the area. So and we do all of this digitally. And even when we talk about deployment, you know, we try to pick out areas for them to deploy their scooters so that it's not a complete mess and then go from there. And so we're still working on a lot of those tools and we're still building a lot of that stuff out. And even right now, we've done some things where we felt like mm, this could be better or this can be changed. And what digital tools allow us to do is to make those changes. And so um, even right now, right? And, you know, downtown, which, you know, I may talk about a little bit later, you know, we have scooters just kind of scattered throughout. We don't have a real program for that area. And what we figured out for that area is that the scattering of the scooters isn't really great. And it's not great for the people who are walking. It's not good for pedestrians. It's not great for the businesses that are in the area either. So what we're trying to do right now is develop parking zones, but those zones being digital. So I don't have to paint the curbs or you know, erect infrastructure, but we can actually digitally create those zones. So we're on a, a project that's going to take a couple of months, but once we're done, we'll be able to have 
hopefully 150 parking zones throughout downtown that will allow us and allow customers to put them in an area and still be able to get to their destination without having to, to walk too far. That's great because I mean, if if you don't solve that problem and people are having to park their scooters in far off places, it sort of defeats the purpose of having this last minute mile or you know, um, being able to solve those transportation challenges and the micro mobility solutions that exist. Um, so why, why is all of this important anyways for cities to move forward? Like why do you need to maybe pursue digital infrastructure uh, to better manage all of these things? Well, you know, as we try to open and expand various programs, we do want to ensure that there's access across the city. But but part of our role, too, is ensuring that there's still comfort throughout the city. So, again, as I mentioned with the downtown area, you know, sure, there's ridership and we have the numbers. People are riding and we know that. But I have people in wheelchairs that need to get through the sidewalk. I have people who just are walking. You know, um, I have elderly people who aren't using scooters, they need to get around. And I have businesses who are looking at this clutter in front of their storefronts, you know, whether it's a small business or a big business, some of them are going out and having to clean it up themselves. And part of what, again, what makes a city wonderful is that we are all part of it. You know, you want to act like you're in the city. You know, you're not, you don't get to just be, do it your own way. You, you're, we're all collectively in it. And part of me, part of us being collectively in it is ensuring that, you know, Sure, I have a person who can ride up and down on a scooter, but I want to make sure my person in a wheelchair can get around without having to navigate around the scooters. And so, you know, that's a long-winded way of saying part of the digital infrastructure piece is I don't have to spend years building necessarily the infrastructure for all of that to work. Rather, if I can connect to my vehicles, if I can connect to the cars, if I can connect to the scooters directly, we can start digitally communicating, letting them know, hey, here's an area where you can't behave in this certain way. And here's an area where you can. And we can use all kinds of demographic layers to figure out what areas work for what. And that's really the big crux of it, having the flexibility to know, hey, this is an area near, you know, where we have a lot of elderly residents and this isn't going to be workable in that area. This is an area where we have less of that. Uh, this is an area where we have transit deserts and we need much more, much more first mile, last mile access. Here's an area that's far more dense and we don't need as much of that. And with the digital tools, you have now the flexibility to make a lot of those changes. And then if they don't work, this is the biggest thing to me, if they don't work, you can make a change again to pull the levers back and forth to make sure um, that it works for your area or for that community. That's awesome. It sounds like it really allows you to be proactive and less reactive to things, as well as being able to better manage the the time frame it would take to enact some of these things. And if you were to do it without the digital infrastructure piece, like then I'm sure you'd have to have like a big communication strategy. You'd have to probably take, you know, several months to get something off the ground and make sure that everyone was aware of everything and kind of enforce those policy changes. Uh, whereas digitally, like it sounds like not quite with the flip of a switch, but pretty darn close with the flip of a switch, can you manage these things? Which I think is a better uh, experience for everyone involved. That's right. And, and as a city, I mean, we can't just flip switches as cities. I mean, I do have to, we have to worry about constituents and and uh, council offices and the mayor's office and, and all of those things to ensure that everyone is comfortable, but it does make it a lot easier. It, and it does relieve some of the, the bureaucratic headache that can come with having to build infrastructure. Uh, and again, infrastructure it's it's not a matter of months it's could be it could be a matter of years you know and, right. <laughs> and those who have to build bike lanes things of that nature they can tell you that you know the, the idea is there and it seems simple but it, it could take so long and and we can digitally do it much much quicker much much sooner as long as we have access directly to uh the providers gotcha so you know you work in policy so what kinds of policies need to be in place to pursue these kinds of deployments or what's working for the LA Department of Transportation that other cities could maybe model off of? You know, it's hard to say specifically what policies need to be in place. I think mm -hmm. it's really more of a paradigm of ensuring that you have flexibility. 
Because again, as we've tried to implement policies, you know, they, they work to some varying degrees of success. In some ways, oh, this has been great. In some ways, mm, this isn't as great as we thought it would be. And what you really need is, you know, leadership and, and that's political as well as within departments that's able to say, okay, we can pivot, we can make changes. Because again, in my role, I work a lot with private businesses and in the private industry, you pivot, you make changes. And the, mm -hmm. the challenge with the public is, you know, when I say the public, what I mean is public agencies is that, again, same with infrastructure. If I build something, it's there, it's, it's stuck. I can't just change it. You know, you make regulations sometimes and it's the same regulation that was in place 30 years ago. And the, the new thing for me about digital infrastructure is that you don't have to wait 30 years to make those changes. And so the, the flexibility is what's really key. And, and if I can say that there's one thing you should always ensure is that, is that you're always thinking about equity and you're always thinking about every part of your city. And again, there's always pieces that are forgotten, um, but you know, like in the taxi industry or the scooter industry, you have to think about just, you know, my young customers, my older customers, my, my wheelchair users, my businesses, the people who are impacted, you know, because what you don't want is you don't want technology to just happen to you. You wanna be able to do it in a way that when technology comes, everyone benefits. And when I say everyone, I mean everyone. And even those who don't necessarily want to use it or be a part of it, it doesn't impact them in a negative way. So that's really the key to me. And I, and I hope that kind of answers your question. No, it does. Thank you so much. And I think that, you know, you're right. Like being able to have a position of flexibility is really important and inclusivity, right? That ability to engage with a bunch of different kinds of communities. And so I imagine that the LA Department of Transportation does some kind of community outreach when they're considering these new policies and they're trying to figure out how best to implement them within a community um, and really address those equity lenses that you're talking about. Um, I think that was one of the things that really inspired me to have this conversation with you was when we were at the Smart Cities Connect conference in the fall and I heard about you know, the equity zones that you had mapped out with your scooter program and just like how you guys were trying to ensure that people in all communities were having the same kind of accessibility as those really like dense urban areas that were popular tourist areas that were getting a lot of the attention and really uh, allowing that technology to spread evenly across your uh, city, which I thought was really fantastic. Um, so other than maybe some flexibility in the equity lens, like what are some of the best practices that you can share about approaching these kinds of technology deployments with our audience, right? There are lots of other people who work with cities that wanna figure out how do I, you know, take this concept and deploy it in my city and what do I need to get started? Um, would love to have your perspective on that. You know, honestly, I think one of the most important things you can do is to communicate with, with the providers directly. You know, I, I often, feel that as a city, sometimes we, you know, we make rules and regulations, sometimes in a little bit of a vacuum, you know, mm. and we can think through all the theoretical constructs of how something can and should work. But oftentimes you have people who are on the ground, which are these businesses who already know, you know, what it looks like. And the challenge with them is often, you know, they know what's going to be most profitable for them. And, and that's great. But as a city, you know, you also have to focus on Again, like as you mentioned, we're trying to do equity because we have areas that we know are profitable for those companies, but that also sometimes means that we have areas that don't get access and we have to incentivize ways for them to service the the less profitable areas or the parts of the community where they're not going to make as much money, which means for us providing low income programs, requiring those types of things, um, and, and then still balancing it out with allowing them to make money in the more tourist high profile areas. And so a lot of what I have to do is communicate with them, you know, whether it's through round table discussions with the industry, um, just talking to them about their businesses, just going out to their warehouses and seeing mm -hmm. how they do their business. What does your product look like? What is the future of this for you? What's your optimal program? And then trying to marry that with what we want as a city for our optimal programs and seeing if, if you know, where those overlaps are, where we fit in the Venn diagram with each other, 
and try to find a way to make it make sense for everyone who lives in the city. So that to me is really the main thing because I can make rules in a vacuum and then, you know, you'll find out that, oh, this isn't working and that's not working. And, and they can tell you, but you don't want to ignore that voice. You want to listen to them and, you know, recognize that they do have a profit motive involved. So, you know, it's it's not always the most forthcoming, you know, um, in terms of their dialogue with you. But if you get if you develop a good dialogue with them and they get used to you and they get to understand that you're not there to stifle innovation. You're there to just help your city, to protect your city and to ensure that everyone has access to things. They tend to lower their guards a little bit and they're much more willing to work with you on, okay, here's what we think could work really great for the city. And you can take your theories and you can take all the, hey, here's a low income program we were thinking about. Does this actually work? And they can tell you, well, in this area, we see X you know, in ridership and you know, we we attempted this in our own modeling and, you know, and then we can work on a program and try things out together. That's great. Thank you so much for that. And I think, you know, you're right. I've done a little bit of work with, you know, public private partnerships between innovative um, startup companies and the city of San Antonio. And it's just at balancing the the goals or the perspectives or the wants of both can be a little challenging simply because they have different ways of going about and making stuff happen right it's much easier to pivot like you mentioned earlier on the private side and on the public side you have to have a lot more things in place in order to execute on something and so I think the relationship building component that you're talking about is very key and I think it's wonderful that you know the LA Department of Transportation is making such an effort to meet people where they're at on the private side to then figure out how to make the best solutions for the city moving forward um, that's really cool. So um, I have two more questions for you. Um, the One of the last questions is, if you could change one thing in mobility or transportation right now for the better, what would it be and why? You know, honestly, I, I don't know if I have a big major change. I mm -hmm. I think the things that I work on now are things that are important to me. And, and a lot of that is just you know, doing things to make it easier to get around. You know, I'm, I'm someone who grew up in Los Angeles and, and on my 16th birthday, I went and I got my driver's license. Why? Because as much as LA is a city, it wasn't easy to get to places that I need to get to, you know? Mm. And so, um, and so at that time, that was the best way. My parents were like, yeah, we can't drive you across town for this and that. And, you know, for band practices or whatever it may be. And, you know, I think, having that in mind, I think about, you know, people who, you know, weren't able to get a hand-me-down car, you know, my folks were able to hand me down their old car and let me drive it around. But, you know, I also had friends who didn't have that access and you're still trying to take a bus. So you're walking, you know, wherever it is to get a bus, changing three different times to get where you need to go, taking an hour and a half to get somewhere versus having to be able to drive it in 30 minutes. You know, those are the things that, I want to be able to help people accomplish, you know, and living in, 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 in any city, you know, um, and that's kind of what I, what I would like, just making it easier to get around, whether it is um, a bus or a scooter or a taxi cab, you know, and whether it's for an emergency or not for an emergency, even if it's just for a date, if it's for just commuting for work, you know, I want it to, to be, not a daunting prospect to not have a private car in your city, mm. you know, and that's really the the thing to me, you know, just, just that, that piece there. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. And uh, what a dream to be able to have easy access, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's, you know, it's South Texas and Texas in general, it's, it's not easy to not have a car in Texas in very similarly, I imagine to a really big city like LA, if you don't have independent transportation, it can be uh, quite a, a challenge and a burden. And so making that easy for everyone only improves everybody's uh, quality of life and experience with these different modes of transportation. So thank you for that. And my final question is because this is the last episode of 2022, which is really exciting. Uh, in the new year, what are you most excited about? You know, I think in the new year, I mean, well, so for the city of LA, we have a lot of new changes um, that have happened. We have a new mayor. Um, we have six new council members. And so it's going to be kind of exciting to 
to a get to know you know that group of people and and really like maybe tap into some potentially new opportunities and and new activities that we can be involved in um and i know that even for me personally with my work you know i'm integrating my taxi cabs onto the mbs platform as well and that will give me access you know real time access to what's going on with our fleets throughout the city and so for me work wise what i'm super excited about is that you know hopefully by june of you know 2023 I'll have the kind of information available to me that will allow me to really create a strong equity program for taxi cabs, which is um, really, you know, something that I would love to do. Uh, you know, taxis have been around for like a hundred years, you know, more depending on your city. And, you know, I feel like they will always be here and they actually do a great deal of service for areas and for people who don't typically have access to service. And so, when so I am hoping by this time in the summer, when summer rolls around, we'll be putting together a program that will ensure, you know, kind of an equivalency of service. If it's five minutes to get it, get a taxi on this part of town, I want it to be five minutes in other parts of town and being able to have, you know, great utilization so that I don't have drivers who, you know, aren't making money and just driving around empty or sitting in an empty cab at like a hotel waiting for three hours. I really want to improve that utilization. And I do think with this data that we're going to be getting, we'll be able to start changing and adjusting their behavior to not only improve utilization, but to ensure access for taxi cabs throughout our entire city. That is really exciting. And there's so much room for disruption within that industry anyways, and also just a better way of viewing what's happening. And I think that it's awesome that you guys are putting that on your MDS platform and would love to have you back um, after the summer to get a check in on what's going on with your taxi project, because I think that would be huge for other cities to be able to model that as well. Um, Jarvis, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a pleasure talking with you. I love all the things that you're working on and it's just been a real treat. Thank you so much, Joyce. And it's great to see you again, like I said earlier. It was great meeting you and it's great to see you again. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, everybody, happy uh, end of the year for 2022. We'll see you in 2023 with a whole bunch of new city chats. And with that, I hope everybody has a great day. Thank you. Yeah. Happy holidays, everybody.